All right, we are continuing to work on our spot illustrations. Let me get to the right class here. It's assignment five. And in the last few videos, we were working on making digital line art, clean digital line art for our sketch. If I go to assignments and scroll down to assignment five, you'll see all of these links. I might refer to some of these in the videos. I'm not going to refer to all of them, but it is something that is worth fully understanding. So the one that is linked in the assignment itself and also here on the assignments page is an exhaustive explanation of digital coloring because there's a lot to know, a lot to understand. And because I work as an illustrator and an editorial illustrator, so I, I not only have to know how it looks on screen, I also have to know how to separate things for professional printing. I love this stuff. So this just goes through all the types of digital coloring, the history of it, where in the 1970s it was limited to only these colors, right? From the 1930s to the 1970s, these are the only color inks, color ink combinations that could be printed. But then since then with digital technology, we have millions of colors, we have different types of printing. And so the basic steps are just myriad. You have so many different options to do. So I break it down this way. We started with a sketch, then we got clean line art, preferably not just a high resolution raster, clean line art, but a vector that can be infinitely scaled. But it can work either way. You know, if you have your line art at 650 pixels per inch at the size of your print job, it's going to look as good as an e-vector. It just will only work for that size, right? If it's a vector, it can work for every size. We're going to be learning how to put flat color behind that line art. And then we're going to be learning variations on that flat color. So I'll be showing you this in a variety of ways. But under assignments, you'll see not just my slides, but then all of these past student slides as well. And we had a, a group presentation this semester on digital coloring, right? So it's this one's on digital inking within Illustrator. And this student likes to use the pen tool and then use strokes. So this is with the curvature tool. So this is a different method than I showed you with the blob brush. It all gets you to the same place, right? To clean vector line art. This is an explanation of digital coloring by these students. This is digital coloring from this digital honors student taking you through. So no matter what kind of approach you find best for yourself, it's going to have to do with layers. And I want you to understand the theory of it. So even if you start, you know, playing improvisational jazz with your coloring, which artists do, you'll understand the principles and avoid the big pitfalls of it. So this is how it's applied in printing of comic books. And all of this is interesting and each of them is different and relates to digital coloring and digital inking in a different way. And then I give you this link to something that's very popular now, even though it's a, an old technology from the 1970s. This is a Japanese form of photocopy and it's called a risograph and it uses toner but it uses colored individually colored ink canisters of toner two at a time <laughs> it's really complex but what it gives you is something that looks like a screen print with varied half screen angles which we'll be learning about but you can use custom ink colors and get results like this so you'll see a lot of individual digital artists offering risograph prints, which is a, an older technology, but they have kind of a handmade feel so that no print is exactly the same, whereas digital prints are always identical. And then you can simulate the kind of risograph texture in Photoshop and in raster programs. So that might be something you want to do with your, with your spot illustration. But ultimately, we go to where we post it, and we see the steps we've done so far. What I've demoed is based on some inspiration. I created a sketch of what I wanted to do. 
It has to be free floating. I then clean that sketch up in Photoshop, a raster program. And then I brought it into Illustrator and I'm starting to, to draw the vector lines. We talked about how you could do it in Photoshop at high resolution, but I'm going to continue building this with the blob brush in Adobe Illustrator. So I am still working on my AI file because that is my working format, right? My Adobe Illustrator format. I have my tablet here because the tablet allows your brush to be pressure sensitive. Tablets are open at the back. I have it set up in Illustrator, which is different than Photoshop. It looks similar, but it's quite different. And so it takes some getting used to. And I want to see my layers. So I have some familiar tools. I have history. I have color guides. But really, I just want to see my layers. And my first layer is my sketch, which I double clicked on and dimmed to 50% to onion skin. And then I locked it and made a new layer on top, just like that. And in this new layer, every time I make a mark, it's going to make a new path. But because I'm using this particular tool, which is perfect for digital inking, the shortcut to it is Shift B. It is not the paintbrush tool. It is the blob brush tool. Because we are putting down a, a blanket of ink, a little puddle of ink. So the settings for my blob brush are a black fill with an empty stroke. And if I double click on the tool, I get to my options. I can set it to be more smooth than accurate and I can set it to be whatever point size I want <clears throat> which is different than pixels because just remember there's no pixels in Illustrator but I can set that size to be pressure sensitive so I make that size you know basically the the thick pin that I want but if I push harder I can get it even thicker so it's kind of like picking your pin size and then if you make it pressure sensitive with your tablet you want to set the variation to be the same size as your, your brush size. Then you say OK. And now, when I start inking, it will smooth it for me and create it as a new path every time it doesn't overlap an existing path. But if I overlap an existing path, this is what's great about the blob brush, it will incorporate it into that path so that they're already merged together. I don't need the Pathfinder. And that allows me to edit them very easily. So let me continue my inking here with that smooth setting. And I can always hit Command Z if I want to redo it. And again, it's not a logo. I don't need it to be exact. Oops. And if I want to change the angle, I go to this magnifying glass option at the bottom of the tools in Illustrator, and I choose the rotate view tool, shift H. So basically between shift H and shift B and command, I have everything I need to digitally ink in Illustrator. So that's shift H. I can rotate the paper. I go to uh, shift B and I get to my blob brush, and that's a much easier angle to draw that curve. I hit Command, and I can click on the vectors to see the anchors in case I need to clean them up. But otherwise, I just keep drawing with the blob brush. Now, what can happen is when you're zoomed in like this, it can be harder to get those tapers from your pressure sensitivity. So if I want it to be a little bit lighter, I'm going to zoom out and go a little bit faster. And this is why I like inking in Illustrator a little bit more than in Photoshop, because not only can I have that smooth setting, but I can move a lot faster with my brush without it lagging behind. Because Illustrator is a lot easier. I'm going to do Shift H and then rotate it to get this angle, then Shift B. Illustrator takes a lot less memory, so it it can follow that that brush command a lot better. So now 
just like with inking with a, a brush and ink in real life, traditionally, I might get these little overlaps, these little bubbles that happen. So what do I do? I hold down Command. I click on it so I can see the anchor points. And now I'm going to use the pencil tool. And the pencil tool, the shortcut for it is just the N key, if that helps. And then with that pencil tool, I can redraw the edges on the inside of the line, hold down Command, see the anchor points, redraw the edges on the outside of the line, and I can set this pencil to be smooth as well. Right. As long as I can see the anchor points, I can redraw them. If I want this feather to be a little bit more pointed on the outside, I can redraw it. And then on the inside, I just need to make sure I see the anchor points. So by using the blob brush, unlike the regular brush or the stroke tool, this gives me an inside edge and an outside edge to modify, which is really helpful. All right. Let's keep inking. Shift B. Things like ovals, things like circles. I would not be able to freehand ink if I didn't have that smooth function. But if I want them incredibly exact, instead of doing them with the blob brush, I can also use the ellipse tool. If you're not, you know, comfortable with your drawing. So what I can do, let's see, let's go to Command H or Shift H. Get this back upright or I can just double click on it and it will lock it. I can now take this stroke-based shape tool, right, and I can play with its properties and make its stroke, switching to my mouse for this, the thickness I want. I can then use the large selection tool to rotate it, to shrink it. This is to get an exact inking. I think I want it about right there. Okay, now the problem is this is outputted with a stroke, not a fill path. What I mean by that is I can't control the inside edge and the outside edge. It just is outputting in five points <laughs> uh, the, the stroke on both sides of that path edge. So what I do is I click on Object, Path, and I'm going to outline the stroke. So it converts it from a stroke to a fill path. This allows me, if I wanted to, to vary the, the edges, which is very helpful for inking. You also don't want to have any strokes as strokes when you save it as a vector and bring it over into Photoshop to color, because the strokes will change depending on how you scale it in Photoshop. But your fill paths will not. Thinks of strokes, stroke weight as an attribute, right? And you don't want those attributes. So now what I could do is use the pencil tool. And if I wanted to, I could do what's called feathering on the inside of this while keeping that perfect oval on the outside. I don't necessarily want to do that, but I could, right? Now I can take that and I can duplicate it. You know, Command C, Command V. Use the large selection tool, and I can use this, rotate it, shrink it, hold down shift to distort it. Actually, don't hold down shift to distort it. So there's lots of ways you can get your inking. Now, if I want this to be very dimensional, I can do Command C, Command V. And I can extend it and stretch it a little bit. So it gives me the sense of three dimensions, right? Oops, need to not hit return. And then I can use my eraser tool while it's selected. and erase where it overlaps. 
click off of it, and then it looks like I have this kind of